This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. Let us worship God. Will you please stand for the call to worship? Do not doubt God's power and might. It is God who has created all that is. It is God who has called to your hearts and spirits all that is good. God is with you. Praise be to God. Amen. In all times and in all places, God is with us. Shout for joy. Get ready to become disciples for Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. We give those at the door a moment to come in as we prepare our hearts for prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, in this season of growth, open our hearts to grow in your love. Help us to truly trust in your creative process in our lives. We look around and we see the beauty of your world. The blossoming flowers and plants, the growth of children, the joy of celebrations, of graduation, of marriage, of receiving new life. God, we give you thanks for these joys and we celebrate them. But we also see the sadness and sorrow that, is, that has invaded the world when systems of injustice and hatred claim people's lives. Lord, have mercy. And prepare us, O oh Lord, to become ambassadors of peace and hope. Help us to place our trust in you so that when we are serving others, they may come to know your abiding love and power. Give us courage. And grant us great joy that we may serve you faithfully. Take charge of us today and take charge of this act of worship. That in this act of worship, we will worship in spirit and in truth. For we pray, believing in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we ask those at the door to... Amen. Let us give our attention to the reading of Scripture. We have two Scripture this morning, and both of them come from the Gospels. And as is our custom, we ask you to stand for the reading of the gospel. 
First Matthew 12, 22 through 30, and then John 17, 9 through 19. Then they brought to him a demoniac who was blind and mute, and he cured him so that the one who had been mute could speak and see. All the crowds were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons, that this fellow cast out the demons. He knew what they were thinking and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man? Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is the word of God for the people of God. Remain standing for the gospel according to John, chapter 17, verses 9 through 19. Jesus is high priestly prayer. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now, I am no longer asking in the world, but they are in the world. Let me read it again. And now, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now, I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, 
but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. We continue to worship God in a time of music, time of praise and music as the sanctuary singers lead us. All is well this morning. Praise Amen. God. And I also want to say how good God has been to me and my family. And, you know, He's kept us from hurt, harm, and danger. So I'm very grateful that um, it's nothing He can't do. And I'm learning each and every day that the journey is not my own. Amen. So before we go into praise and worship, I want to ask those who can to please stand with us in this time. Amen. <laughs> Let's go.
is why I'm living. Praise his holy name. His holy name. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name.
Praise God. We're going to look at the subject today, the house that stands. The house that stands. And I'm using house there, especially synonymous with church. We've been talking about the church. Last week we spoke about the church. We gave a definition of the church. And we spoke about Jesus saying, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So today, we begin to, we, we continue to talk about the church and how it might stand. And in today's passage, Jesus is talking about the house that stands, the house that stands. And particularly, we want to look at Matthew 12 and especially verse 25. Matthew 12 and verse 25. A house divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. The context is when Jesus healed a demoniac who was blind and mute. That is, he couldn't talk. We know what mute is. And as it is today, so it was in Jesus' day that no matter how much good you do, your detractors will find a way to condemn it. You understand that? You ever try to do something that you know was God, God purpose? Something that you know was good? And something that you thought would have 100% of the votes. And it get voted down. Have you ever tried to, to get something right, done, and found out that your detractors have more influence than you? And it didn't get done. But Jesus said something important. He said... Listen, if you are saying that what I just did was evil and is by the power of demons that I healed this demoniac, then I want to tell you something. Think about it. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Satan can't be against Satan. Or else his kingdom will fail. Trust me, Satan is interested in building Satan's kingdom. He doesn't sleep. Christians take rest. Satan don't sleep. Always working. And then the old people say, devil find work for idle hands to do. When you start an idol, they are going to work stronger. So Jesus said, if Satan, if he's in a allowing his angels, who are the demons, to cast out demons, then his kingdom not working. But if it is by the power of God, that I have done what I have done, then the kingdom of God has overtaken you because Satan can't cast out Satan because a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Let's spend a moment reflecting on that idea of the divided kingdom, the divided house. A house 
divided against itself can't stand. When we start to talk about a house that is divided against itself, we have a lot of experiences that we can talk about. We can talk about a family that is going through ongoing feud with another family. I don't know if you, you um, you know, today um, communities are a lot different. But some of the older folks know about perhaps communities where people are a lot closer together geographically. And they know about quarrel going on across the fence, you know. One family warring with another family across the fence. They have heard all kinds of words not worthy of being repeated. You talk about bad words, they have heard bad words invented. <laughs> family warring against family. Well, in fact, I have read of a real famous one, and perhaps you have heard it, between two families called the Hatfields and the McCoys. I understand that they're real historical families, you know that those two families lived on opposite sides of the West Virginia-Kentucky line in the late 19th century. And they carried on a bloody disagreement that lasted for nearly 30 years. Imagine two families quarreling for 30 years. That's almost a lifetime. But not only did they quarrel, the feud left at least 12 people dead. Both families suffered. And what do you think they gained from the fight? Anybody want to take a guess? Nothing. Which is usually what happens with fights. From this long-standing fight, they gained nothing but suffering. A divided house, the point I want to make, a divided house can have dangerous and even deadly consequences. Quarrels. What do they lead to? Quarrels. Well, we have heard of quarrels on an even more deadly scale, a divided house. Countries divided and opposed to each other for decades. Have you heard about Israel and Palestine? Well, maybe you heard about that, but maybe you never heard about India and Pakistan. Divided house. And perhaps you heard about India and Pakistan, but you never hear about North and South Korea. Divided house. And we can go on and on. You ever hear about Democrats and Republicans? <laughs> Divided house. You know, Abraham Lincoln spoke about the divided house in an 1858 speech when he was accepting the Republican Party's nomination to the United States Senate. You know what he says? Well, first of all, you probably know that he was running against somebody who was all in favor of slavery. A guy called Stephen E. Douglas, who argued that individual states should vote on whether to uphold or to abolish slavery. And he was convinced that the states could continue to coexist despite their profound differences on such an important topic. And perhaps inspired by Jesus, because we know that Lincoln prayed a lot. 
I'm not throwing any, I'm very careful about what I say about pol politicians. I'm not saying anything about politicians today. But we know historically Lincoln prayed a lot. And we are told when we read, he really believed God. And he quoted these words, he says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. End of quote. So my words, those are Lincoln's words. But Lincoln was speaking as a prophet that day as he shared his conviction that such opposing views will tear the country apart during a civil war. Sometimes you don't think about how much blood was shed in this country in a civil war in which brothers took up arms against brothers. And what were they were fighting for? To keep slaves. We say from time to time how racism kills. But you know what this civil war reminds us of? We have the misguided idea that racism is just killing black people. But racism kills people, period. How many people died in the civil war? You want to take a guess? 750,000 people. More deaths than coronavirus so far. What are the black people? Think about it. Was it black people that died in the Civil War to keep slaves? Ah. Racism is not just killing black people. Racism has killed people. We are misguided when we think that, it, that our, our hatred will only destroy one people. We have the human race. That's the house. Think about it. And a house divided against itself cannot stand. If the human race decides to oppress other members of the human race, it's going down. Everybody will go down. We don't get the picture yet. But Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, this is where we're making the connection with the church. Now, I want you to pull up those verses for me, please, if you can. Matthew 12, 25, and then John 17, 9 to 11. I want you to see those verses up there. Let's go especially to verse 25. We're not going to read the whole thing. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul... The ruler of the demons, that this fellow cast out the demons, he knew that what they were thinking, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Then I want you to pull up those words where Jesus is praying for the church. It's like he anticipated there are going to be times when the church is going through a rough time. Come on, media team, pull up the other verses right below that. John 17, and particularly the verses that I want us to look at. Pull the passage up. All right. He is praying especially that we will be one. That the church will be one. First he said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. But in this one, he's actually praying for the church. He says, I'm asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me. Because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Well, I want to make the connection here. 
between Jesus' prayer and the utterance that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Because I believe that certain things are being communicated to us. And I'm going to point them out quickly in three quick points. And it's this. Point number one. We have to pray and work to avoid the powerlessness of a divided church. Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, in John, even before we come to that, we often use the word demonic. And do you know what the word demon means? Or demonic means? You know the root word, demonic, or the root word for demons? It's not what we usually think of, you know, when we think of demons, we think of a creature, an animal-like creature with back ears, perhaps black in color, and he has a fork in his hand. The demonic, the word demonic means to divide. To divide. And therefore, anything that divides with destructive intent or for destructive ends can appropriately be described as demonic. And so if you're working on a God purpose, but somebody comes and says, let's work against that. We're not just talking about differences of opinion. But we're talking about something that is working against the purpose of God. That can be said to be demonic. A house divided against itself. Well, Jesus said in John 13 and verse 1b, what he did and how he lived to make sure that the church lived and behaved in ways that are consistent with being not the divided house, but the united house. And here's what the scripture says about him. Having loved his own in the world, he loved them to the end. A divided church is a powerless church. And such divisions usually occurs when we are fighting against our core values. John 17 and verse 4. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And we can ask the question, how did Jesus glorify God on earth? And how can we glorify God on earth? And the way we glorify God on earth, the way we finish the work that God has given us to do as a church is to do like Jesus did, to love one another as Christ has loved us. Uh, because when we fail to love one another as Christ has loved us, we function as a divided house. And so the way we avoid being the divided house is to pray and work for that community that Christ has called the church so we do not end up being the powerless church. When we are working with divisive purposes, when we are working to frustrate the purposes of God, we are acting as people who are part of the divided house. And so, little acts of sabotage that we plan. When you see these little acts of sabotage that come up against a God purpose, you have to stand and say, no. Some time ago, I came across a really clearly 
illustrated example of how a house can be divided and how we have to say no to those destructive, those demonic influences that rise up. There was this dramatization and it happened on somewhere on the African continent of this ambulance in a hurry, a siren on, going towards a house or going to a place, obviously somebody was very sick. But they, they, they came upon a bottleneck traffic and they needed help. And luckily, they can't get through. And there was this other powerful guy, it's either the ambulance got through or this other powerful guy in a car got through. And somehow, luckily, or so they thought, they got the police involved. And when they thought that the police would say, to the other powerful guy, get out of the way, let the ambulance pass. What do you think the police did? Tell the ambulance, go back. Let the guy pass. The powerful guy had his way. But that's not the way that the system is supposed to work. You know, it's the same in America as in other countries that when you hear this siren, and when you hear an ambulance, you're supposed to get out of the way. That way, or that day, a demonic purpose took charge. But that's not the end of the story. When the powerful guy got home that day, saw his wife looking very sad. And he heard siren blasting coming in. And they reached but his son was already dead. Ambulance was going to try to save his son's life. But here's the lesson in it for all of us. The African proverb says, don't throw stones in the marketplace because you're not sure who it's going to hit. And so we have to be careful when we are encouraging a divided house and when we are planning acts of sabotage because we don't know precisely who will suffer. So as a church, we have to make sure that we work for and pray for a community that functions as the united house. Quickly, let me make the other two points. The next one is this. We have to pray and work for the power of a united house, of course. Avoid a divided house, but pray for the power of a united house. Let's look at two scriptures quickly. Acts 4, 32 to 33. This is how the early church functioned. Now the whole group of those who believed were one heart and soul. Talk about power. And no one claimed private ownership of any possession, but everything they owned was held in common. Listen with it. With great power. With great power. The apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Some powerful things happen. Some powerful things happen. John 17 and verse 20. Jesus praying. I ask not only on behalf of these but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word. You see, the church we described last week is not limited by definition to your denomination or my denomination. The church is that called out people of God. And we have to work with this body to make sure that we work together for the purposes of God. And this church is made up of people who have gone on beyond who are now in the cloud of witnesses cheering us on as we run this race and is made up of people still to come. This community is huge. It's not just your denomination, but it is those that have gone on. And guess what? It's those to come. So it's, it's, it's like we talk about the church triumphant. That's those who have gone on already. And we talk about the church militant. That's those of us who are still fighting here. 
and there are still others to come. We have to work in such a way where we work to achieve the purposes of God. And you ever heard about the word collaboration? And you ever heard about the word unity? And you ever heard about the, work, the, the, the phrase working together? And you ever heard this expression, team, T-E-A-M, together everyone achieves more? Well, when we work as a team together, when we work as a church together, we achieve far more. Well, I want to use just this illustration and I'm going to rush through point three quickly. Point two and three. But, but, but think about this. You know a guy named Usain Bolt? You know what is the, the number for the world record for an individual sprinter? You don't know? 9.58. 9.58, the fastest human in the world. You know, nobody can break the record yet, unless you heard something that I haven't heard. Anybody break Bolt's record yet? Somebody break it? Tell me who. But in, a, in an international event? Oh my God, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. But listen. I, I still make the point. So it, it got, so an individual broke it last night, but we don't know what their numbers were. Usain Bolt did 9.58. But which, which relay team is the fastest in the world? Oh God, you all don't know that? Jamaican relay team. The Jamaican relay team. Do you know that the Jamaican relay team, the same team, you know what was their time? The average of their time? 9.21. The point is this, and this point is not original to me. I heard an African preacher make the point, and it's a good point. And especially for a church with so many Jamaicans, we need to understand this. Bolt ran faster, working with the team. And the team ran faster than any individual runner. The average time of the Jamaican relay team that holds the world record was 37 seconds faster than the individual who holds the world record. Together. Everyone achieves more. I wonder if the new guy that broke the record ran as fast as 9.21. Probably not. Check his time. But together, when we work as a team together, as a church together, we do so much more. So let me say this finally. Finally, there are some simple acts of faith that will help your church to stand. There are some simple acts of faith that will help your church to stand. There are many churches that work together to provide food, water, and shelter for people who have suffered disaster. Even in the United Methodist Church, there's a body known as Omkor. And wherever in the world there is disaster, they show up. We can work like that to present a church that is united. And there are churches that are doing more to establish tutoring centers for children in after-school programs to encourage them in reading and writing and math. Together, they can work to achieve more. But I want to tell you some things that's happening in your own very Connecticut here, where the church is working as a united house. There's an organization that this denomination is a part of, of this church is a part of, perhaps you've heard of them, and it's called GIA. And I never always remember what the, the syllables mean. I think it's the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance. I think that's what it is. Yes, that's it. But they've achieved some great things for us so far. You know, one of the things that they've been able to achieve that got passed in law is welfare liens, and you heard me talk about that before, where if you owe, 
If you used to get welfare, and God help you get out of welfare, but that welfare in the state of Connecticut is a debt. And so if you get a house and one day you want to refinance the house, you have to pay back for that. It was like a tax on poverty. They managed to get that changed. But that's the church working together. But also recently, they managed to get clean slate signed into law. You know what clean slate is? If any time you committed a crime in this country, there's a whole set of legislation against you. You have a record. And no, 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 no place will employ you. They managed to get signed into law that certain things, certain crimes, I mean, they're still fighting over certain things and specific crimes, but signed into law that certain crimes can be expunged from your record after you have served your time so that you can go on and live and you don't have to live under the shadow of a record. Now, this organization is made up of about 40 different congregations or more, but it is an illustration of the church working together to stand. Pull the conclusion up for me. What our scriptures teach us today the scripture of Jesus saying that a divided house can't stand. The scripture of Jesus praying for the church is simple. We as individuals and as a community must pray and work to avoid the powerlessness of a divided church. Avoid the sabotage. And we as individuals and as a community must pray and work for the power of a united house. Because together everyone achieves more. Bolt as a team run faster than bolt as an individual. And there are some simple acts of faith that will help your church to stand. And I lift up the example of gear and some other examples where when we work together with others for the common good, this church of Jesus will stand. And in some ways, some wonderful ways, we see the truth of the text we expounded last week. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. At this point, we are going to have some some music, and just before Brother Maurice comes with the music, let's just say a prayer. Great and loving God, we praise your holy name, and we ask you for your strength, that as a church and as individuals, we would know the power of a house united for your will and for your purpose, and that we will work to be part of that house, your true community of people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.
Praise God. I'm going to say a prayer for the blessing of the offering and the benediction. I ask you to, to stand. And following that, we following the benediction after the cameras are off, just a couple quick announcements. Holy God, magnificent, sustaining farmer of the present and the future, receive these gifts, we pray. And through our offering, help us to know that in some surprising way that you are bringing into being something wonderful and something new and something great. Bless these gifts and bless the givers abundantly, exceedingly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Life is a mystery. We walk by faith. God calls us when we least expect it, inviting us to be in Christ. So walk out into the world as part of Christ's church, knowing that you're part of God's life-saving new creation. Life is a mystery. We walk by faith. Amen. Please be seated briefly. Want to give